Hello and welcome to lecture 18 of the class From Data to Decisions. I'm Chris Mack, professor for this course, and this is the second part in a series of lectures on how to test for outliers. Recall that last time we defined an outlier as an observation so different from the others that we suspect it was generated by a different mechanism. But what are the potential outlier mechanisms? Well, there's different ways you could describe it, but uh, in terms of, of probabilities and probability distributions, we often say there are two kinds of outlier mechanisms. One is where the true distribution of our data has very heavy tails. This means that we get some outlying points, some extreme points, more frequently than we expect because maybe we're expecting a distribution with lighter tails, like a normal distribution, and instead we get a distribution with heavy tails, like a, a Cauchy distribution, for example. In that case, it's not that the outlier mechanism is um, an error or some problem. It's just that we weren't expecting a mechanism that produced such heavy tails. The second potential mechanism for generating outliers is when the data is contaminated. This is the more classic way in which we think about outliers. Our data has been contaminated by a second distribution. The second distribution either has a significantly different mean or a significantly larger variance so that we get some extreme data. Now, if we simply recorded a number down wrong in our lab notebook, well, that would be a second distribution of only one data point uh, with a significantly different mean. If we had a um, broken measurement tool that was behaving more erratically, it might be uh, a larger variance for a certain portion of the data that we collected, for example. When we start testing for outliers, the most common type of test is based on how rare this data point is. If we look at a data point and we say, uh, this is more rare than we would have expected for the number of data points we have, then we'll uh, uh, say that it's potentially an outlier. So the, the best, what people have found is the best for how rare the data is, is to studentize the data. In other words, take the value, subtract off the mean of the sample, and divide by the standard deviation of the sample. Uh, in other words, we ask, how many standard deviations away from the mean is this data point? If it's only a few standard deviations away from the mean, then it's a pretty typical uh, data point. If it's three or four or five or six standard deviations away from the mean, then it is a more unusual data point that we suspect might have generated by another mechanism. We call this studentizing data because uh, of the student's t distribution. If x happened to be normally distributed, if you take x, subtract off the sample mean and divide by uh, the sample standard deviation, that uh, random variable will follow a student's t distribution. Now here we're going to take the additional step of taking the absolute value because we don't care whether it's a, an outlier that's too high or an outlier that's too low. We're going to find the most use of this uh, studentized data approach when we look at residuals from a model fit. So we fit the model to the data, we subtract off the best fit model from the data values, and the, what's left over is called the residuals. But to studentize the residuals will require some little bit of extra work. So we're going to talk about that case coming up in a few lectures. Um, but so for right now, discuss um, um, raw data, data like uh, multiple measurements of the same thing, uh, things that we, we think come from a, a single population but might be contaminated. So let me mention. Uh, outliers and how they relate to robustness. Consider one bad data point. Now, bad means it's highly unusual. It's very different from all the others. Whether it was caused by a mistake or some other reason, I'm not going to speculate, but uh, it's, it's highly 
unusual compared to the others. Um, it, it's a contaminant uh, uh, coming from a different distribution. Well, if we look at the mean of our sample, including this one outlier, the expected value of that mean is going to be the mean of the population, all the other data points we think are just fine, plus this extra term, this extra piece that comes from the outlier. Likewise, the expectation value of the sample variance will equal the population variance plus this extra term. Uh, here we're assuming that all the data points except the outlier are independent and identically distributed with a mean mu and a variance sigma squared. Now let's further assume that this outlier is really big. How big? Well, bigger than mean and bigger than uh, the, the standard deviation. Not only bigger than the mean and the standard deviation, but bigger than the mean and the standard deviation multiplied by n. Actually, it's the standard deviation multiplied by the square root of n that matters here. But um, in either case, if the outlier is very large, uh, then we see that mean and the standard deviation of our sample become dominated by this one outlier. And more so, even more so for the, the case of the standard deviation because of the fact that my standard deviation takes the outlier and squares it. So if it's significantly larger than the mean, its impact on the standard deviation is even greater. So if we have one large outlier, our mean becomes dominated by the outlier, the standard deviation becomes do dominated by the outlier, and as a result, a studentized outlier value converges to a number that is independent of the outlier, only for the case where the outlier is very, very large. In other words, this is the maximum possible value of the, that studentized, absolute studentized outlier value T. Uh, and you can see it's a function of n. It goes as the square root of n, approximately, and uh, therefore the larger number n, the bigger the value of t is possible. If uh, the outlier is not as extreme as all that, well, then the value of t will not be as large as this maximum possible value. We're going to see that maximum possible value popping up in just a moment. The, the test we're going to use, the, what most people consider the best test for outliers, if you assume the underlying distribution of the data, except for the outlier, of course, is a normal population, the best test is the Grubbs test. It's the best test because it has the most power. Um, and it has, right out of the bat, it has the potential of easily finding one outlier. And as Grubbs developed this, he also showed us how to do two outliers with this test. And then later, other people figured out ways of having multiple outlier detection by using the Grubbs test iteratively. That's a little bit more tricky. But the standard Grubbs test could find one outlier or two, um, and it tests separately for an outlier that's in either an upper or a lower tail. But if you have two outliers, you have two cases, right? They can both be on one tail, the upper or the lower, or they both they could be in opposite tails, one in the upper and one in the lower. And therefore, the, the uh, test turns out to be different depending on which of those cases you think you have. For two outliers, we have to use a different critical value depending on whether the outliers are both on the same side, sides of the mean. So we begin by calculating the Grubb statistic uh, called the in this case, the Grubbs ratio. And all we do is find the sum of the squares of the errors, beta minus the mean quantity squared, sum them all up, with the outliers included in the data set and with the outliers removed from the data set, whether it's one or two, depending on which test you're doing. And this ratio is the ratio we're going to test. We have a table of critical values, and we're going to compare experimental Grubbs ratio to the critical value from this table.
I've provided uh, a document table of critical values on the course website associated with this lecture. So you can easily look those up. Now think about the scrubs ratio. If the outliers are not particularly extreme, then the sum of square errors with the outliers removed will be only a little bit smaller than the sum of square errors for the full data set. But if the outlier is particularly large, then the sum of square errors with the outlier removed will be much smaller than the SSE of the full data set, and Grubbs ratio will get small. So we have a critical value, and if the Grubbs ratio is less than the critical value from this table, then uh, we'll say that we have identified the outliers. There's an alternate formulation that's useful for a single outlier where we have a critical value for the studentized residual. So we calculate T uh, for that potential outlier, the extreme value, either be an extreme max or an extreme min point. And we calculate T in the standard way. Uh, and we can have a table of critical T values, or we can calculate the critical T value from this simple formula below. Um, the formula uh, shown here, I'll get to in just a moment. But first, let me note that for the case of a single outlier, this T value is related to the Grubbs ratio in a very simple way. It's simply 1 minus T squared over M minus 1. So obviously, if, if you have Grubbs ratio critical value, you can calculate what the T critical value is and vice versa. That's, again, for the case of a single outlier. Uh, the Grubbs ratio tables include the cases of two outliers as well. All right, how can you calculate the critical value? If you wanted to plug in a formula in Excel or R or something, there's the formula. Note that the beginning of the formula is the maximum possible value of t. The thing inside the square root you'll recognize is a number less than 1. But the critical value, of course, has to be less than the maximum possible value. How much is less is, is based on this. n minus 2 is the number of degrees of freedom. Uh, because uh, we've got a mean and a standard deviation uh, as parameters in our calculation of t. And then it, because it's a student t distribution, or capital T, uh, we use a critical value of t alpha over 2n with n minus 2 degrees of freedom. So that term uh, we can again look up or, or calculate directly. Notice that the significance level it's alpha over 2n. For a two-sided test, normally we would look up alpha over 2 uh, for the critical t values, but that's, remember, for a single data point. Here we're looking at one out of a, a collection of n data points, which is why we're using alpha over 2n as the significance level. Um, and alpha is the normal significant level that we that we typically use, like uh, 0.01 or 0.05. Um, remember from the last lecture that the alpha used for identifying an outlier is typically less than the alpha we use for all the other statistical tests that we're using our data for. We can perform iterated tests. Uh, there is procedure that people have developed carefully. If you if you want to find some unknown number of outliers, call that number k, but we don't know what it is until we do the test. In some given sample, uh, we start with one outlier. We find, go to find the max value, calculate the t, compare it to t critical, and say, is it an outlier or not? If it is an outlier, we remove it. Then we repeat the test for the remaining data. Now we have n minus 1 data points. And we do the test again. But when we do the test again, we have to use a different critical t statistic. If you use the same critical t statistic that you used before, um, you, can, you can really mess up uh, this iterative approach. Critical t statistic depends on k, the current iteration, uh, whether you're looking at the second or the third or the fourth potential outlier. 
But if you do it right uh, using a different critical P statistic for every different iteration, then this technique can work. It's called extreme studentized deviate approach to uh, identifying and removing outliers. And the paper mentioned below uh, provides the details. One last uh, approach for outlier identification is Peirce's criterion. And I mention it mostly for historical significance. Uh, Benjamin Peirce uh, was the first person to develop a statistical outlier removal procedure. Before this time, it was mostly uh, eyeballing it, looking at it and say, hmm, that, that data point just ain't right. Get it out of here. And while I think you know, engineers are, and scientists with a lot of experience with data could probably be pretty good at that, but is not objective. So Benjamin Peirce developed the first technique. His famous uh, philosopher's son, Charles Sanders Peirce, uh, also improved upon and, and helped develop this technique. It's based on comparing probability of getting this data set with the outliers to the probability of getting the data set without the outliers. So it sounds a little bit like Grubb statistic, but it, it works in a different way. It does assume a normal distribution. You can remove multiple outliers in each iteration. It, it can have multiple iterations, but you can actually remove more than one outlier per iteration. And um, it uses the T statistic, just like the Grubbs test, tables of critical values, just like the Grubbs test. But it's not as commonly used as the Grubbs test because it's not quite as uh, rigorous as the Grubbs test is. Grubbs test just works a little bit better. So there's our second lecture on testing and identifying outliers. What have we learned in this lecture? First, what is a studentized outlier? What is the maximum possible value for a studentized outlier? for a given value n, number of data points in this data set. And finally, you should be able to perform the Grubbs test on a single data point or on two data points using the tables provided. That's our lecture 18. Next time, I'll have some final thoughts on outliers.